Okay. All right, well, hello everyone and welcome to this three o'clock session at the Texas Conference on Digital Libraries. My name is Adrienne Shapiro and I'm the Manager of Digital Initiatives and Assessment at Texas Mormons University and a member of the TCDL Planning Committee. Before we get started, we have some brief housekeeping. Texas Digital Library and the TCDL Planning Committee are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive of all people. We ask that everyone be respectful in speech and action, attempt collaboration before conflict, refrain from demeaning and discriminatory behavior and speech, and be mindful of your fellow participants. You can view TCDL's code of conduct at tdl.org. Um, this session will run until about 3.50, and we invite you to use the chat to say hello and post your questions for the Q&A. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce this hour's presentation from Mold Remediation to Collection Digitization, presented by Michelia Mason, who works as the head librarian at the Southwest Research Institute. Thank you for being here today, Michelia. Um, thank you, Adrian. I appreciate you. Um, and thank you to everyone who is here today. Um, this is one of the newer session types that TDL made available called a reverse workshop. So I'm really going to be relying on a, a lot of your interaction today um, because the goal is to kind of crowdsource uh, ideas and questions and your insights and experiences that can really help those of us present company included wrap our minds around what aspects um, of digital collection and digital preservation um, projects we need to be aware of to, to really move forward with a pursuit or whether or not we do move forward with something. Um, as mentioned in the session description, our library went through a mold remediation um, very recently. We finished up in February of 2022. And so that entire experience really just shed light on the susceptibility of our collection. Um, and we are a staff of five, a small staff of five, and we're starting from ground zero. So we're in basically the literature search stage and the opportunity to come here today with the community of people who have a background in digitization was just um, too perfect to pass up. So again, I really appreciate your time in attending the session today. And I look forward to any information that you can provide or just the questions that you have as well, because sometimes just having the right questions is half of the hard work. Um, so we'll start off today really with just a quick background about Southwest Research Institute so you can get a sense of um, who we are and what we do. And then in turn, of course, then what content we do make available to the community based on the researchers and the engineers that we support. And then I'll talk about the mold experience from the discovery of the mold to the validation of our collection with our leadership and to the remediation process. And the off chance of that can be helpful to any of you. Not that I want any of you to have to go through a mold <laughs> remediation, um, but we'll share some of the information um, that we went through, again, in case that can be helpful. And then finally, we'll spend the bulk of this session in that discussion space. So we'll be using Jamboard to capture your questions, capture your thoughts and your insights. Um, I do have some question prompts, some things that I'm interested in, in learning about, um, but we are absolutely going to be spending some time on the questions that you all um, want to see answered by the group or have some further discussion on as well. So as I mentioned, um, we are with Southwest Research Institute, and we're a nonprofit research organization in San Antonio, Texas. And we do support about 1,500 active researchers and engineers, more or less in the applied and hard sciences. So we're talking about chemistry and chemical engineering, mechanical engineering, space science, automation and data systems. We have nine distinct technical areas that we support. And so being that we are focused more on supporting um, science and engineering, that is the type of content that is maintained in our library. So you'll find book club books and um, professional development. But other than that, all of our resources are strictly towards science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So um, I meant to give a warning. We have books here showing up with mold on it. So I'll let you know when this slide is over in case you're sensitive to this. Um, but in July of 2021, we kind of encountered a, a perfect storm situation where 
there was a lot of rain that summer. Um, the thermostat broke a, in an isolated area of our journal collection. And then we also had a lot of staff working from home because of COVID. So nobody caught the situation until the mold had already, already taken hold of a lot of our content. And each and every shelf in that section had uh, mold on the works. Now, as you can see here, um, in some of the pictures, you'll have a volume with no mold, no mold, and then a volume with mold. So all in the same shelf. And as an attempt to bring some silver lining to us, the remediation specialist let us know that, that was an indication that we were using the works um, because of the oils on our hands and we were selecting the volumes to scan for interlibrary loan or document delivery. Um, so among the 10,000 square feet or so of journals that we house, this was an isolated area of 4,200 square feet of journals that were affected and 1,000 linear feet or so of the journals had visible mold, visible mold showing on, on the works. Um, so fortunately, it was an isolated area away from the other areas of journals that we maintain in our library building. But unfortunately, it was the area where we house the oldest journals in our collection from the 1830s um, to the early 2000s. So we knew based on the mold in that area, that we were going to be working against the argument of discarding the entire collection to make room for more offices or because the expense of remediating the entire collection would be um, too exorbitant for the, the organization to pursue. So mold slide is gone, you can open your eyes now. But in order to really engage our leadership, we wanted to pull together the most basic information that at the very least would let them see the value of the collection. So we stuck with Excel because <laughs> that's what our leadership is, you know, they're comfortable with it. They had all the information in one place. We provided them with one pad that had options and considerations. And it wasn't even an option that we lifted there to discard the whole collection. It was we'd remediate or we could potentially select some of the more obscure content and remediate that. Um, we would look at the aggregators to see if there was a comparable way to obtain the material um, electronically. And then we would look at if we could purchase the archive that were comparable as well, um, individually from the publishers. So what you're seeing here is just um, a consolidation of the information that we provided to our leadership. We had done an inventory in 2014 or 2015 that listed all of the journals in each section in each area. So we knew exactly what journals and what coverage of the journals were in that section. And we provided them with a title list, the ISSNs, the coverage of that information, um, the location of that content. And then we used TAPASA or OCLC to pull the OCLC numbers, as well as the number of holding libraries that had print content um, in their libraries based on the journals that we were holding. We also made use of the Print Archives Preservation Registry, their collection comparison tool. And that allowed us to take the OCLC numbers and the ISSNs, upload it to their collection comparison tool and get a sense of what other libraries or consortia out there were um, committed to retain uh, comparable coverage of the content that we had in our own print collection. So all of this information is what we were pulling in kind of a race against time. We didn't want the mold situation to um, increase. And we knew that based on the, the bids that we were waiting on from the remediation specialist, um, our leadership was gonna make a decision uh, sooner rather than later. So luckily enough for us, we went through the work of pulling this information, but what really allowed our leadership to um, decide to remediate the entire section of our content was the interlibrary loan data. So we let them know that based on all of the print articles that we provide as a lender, 77% um, of all of our um, content provided from our in terms of journal article requests was provided from our print collection. And the requests from that 77% um, range from 1929 through 2008. 27% um, of all of our requests come from UTSA. And UTSA and Southwest Research Institute have a very solid research relationship. So that was a point in our favor as well. 
And then the other two libraries that are in our top three borrowers was the NASA, J NASA Johnson Space Center and the Environmental Protection Agency Library. So again, as an organization um, who does a lot of government and commercial work, being able to provide the fact that our resources are supporting these other government ent entities um, and um, basically other clients that we do project work with, again, a, a point in our favor. Um, and then of course, providing content for our own staff, 40% of our um, document delivery requests are filled from our print collection. So with the ILL data, the information that we pulled and letting them know that you know, EBSCO and ProQuest as an aggregator weren't going to be able to provide the comparable coverage of our print collection and what the cost would be to obtain the content individually from um, publishers. Um, and especially with the competitive bids that we got from remediation specialists, we were able to move forward with the full remediation of the collection in that area. So this is a map that just shows um, the layout of the journals and the affected area. Each of the rows here are the actual shelving units and they were sectioned off. We have study carrels off on the side. The hallway was sealed off and made a book cleaning space. And then another sealed area was made against that in between our other two journal areas for clean book storage. So the dehumidifiers were run to bring the relative humidity down from the 60% where it was back to around 40%. Each of the areas were sectioned off and sealed. The ceiling tiles and the furniture were removed from the area. And then the process could be started with the cleaning of the work. So they moved section by section. They cleaned the books. Once the books were cleaned, they were stored in the book storage space. The shelving in that section was then sanitized. They did a mold reading. If that section passed the mold reading, the clean books were brought back in. There was another mold reading, and if it passed that, then that section was sealed again, and they moved to the next section and continued that process going forward. So that was the entire remediation. And again, we just finished that process in February of this year. Um, and all the work we did to really understand you know, how available the print content in our collection was, um, how accessible it was from other libraries and whether there was an option to get it electronically online really helped us understand um, what is obscure and what we need to focus on in terms of we need to be able to preserve this content because there's only three other libraries that have this material. Um, so we have a good sense of selection of materials um, and the reason for digitization but everything else we're starting, I don't want to say blind, but we're starting from scratch here. We're starting at the point where we are open to learning. And that is the whole point of the session today is really to ask some questions, not to sound like Little Mermaid, ask some questions and get some answers here um, about how we can move forward, or even if it is feasible for us to move forward with an idea of digitizing um, scholarly works in a journal collection. And I know that's different than a lot of, you know, a repository or um, a special heritage collections. So that's really the whole focus today is to really um, have some discussion around what we're trying to digitize. But then of course, just digitization in a general sense, helping us understand what questions we should be asking um, and what information would be useful moving forward. So from here, we are going to have um, a Jamboard discussion and I have not been watching the chat. So if any questions came in on the chat, I will jump to that, but I'm gonna put the link in the chat for um, the Jamboard link for the Jamboard uh, board so that we can all interact together. And let me go ahead and bring that up here. The first slide will be very similar to the presentation. So when you get there, let me know, let me know when you're there. Perfect, I see everybody popping in, I'm so excited. So the first slide that we have, um, it's really just to get you familiar, in the off chance that you're not familiar with Jamboard, we're gonna be using the sticky note on the left-hand side. So go ahead and throw in a sticky note, let me know um, your organization or any of the digitization collections that you would like 
to, to promote as well or share, because we will be looking at those <laughs> later on. Not in this session, but this information will be available for everyone afterwards. Um, and I think it would be just another great learning opportunity to see what's already been done. Take a look at um, the collections that you would like to emphasize as well. So you can use your sticky note, put in your organization, and or any um, collections that you would just like to share with people. Perfect. Great. So y'all getting fancy with the colors. It's gonna be a pretty jam board. And of course, at any point in time, feel free to unmute um, as we actually move towards the, the questions that can generate some discussion. We're a small group today, um, so I do encourage you to just jump right on in with any questions or comments or insights. The session is recorded, so we can always go back and kind of affiliate the, the responses with whatever we're looking at at the Jamboard. Perfect. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna move us to the next slide in the Jamboard and that will really start our discussion. Um, but you can move back and forth between the slides um, as you would like. The, the next slide we're gonna look at here is our prompt. Help us, you know, I don't know what I don't know until I don't know it. So what questions or challenges should we be considering prior to approaching a digitization project? So have at it. I think oftentimes the main question I always have, <laughs> copyright. That is exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> it's always copyright because the answer to copyright is always, it depends. Um, so great, 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 great. File storage, prioritization. Perfect. Staffing is a big one, yeah. And some of these questions we'll be getting to later in the session too to talk more about. So I'm really loving all of these questions that you're putting in. Yeah. Great. So I have a check mark up in the top corner. You can um, copy that check mark. And I would like to, us to take a minute. And if there's any question here that you would like to spend time kind of discussing at length, we'll kind of go on your votes here. Just put your check mark on any of the stickies that you would like to spend some time on. Great. Someone got too fancy. Let's see if we can. Did we break it? Did we break Jamboard? <laughs> Austin, that is the correct response, Austin. Oh dear. Let me see if I can. Give me one second here. I'm gonna jump out. Mm 
Michelia, it's Leah. Do you want me to try to fix that? Sure. Okay, I'll take it so you can keep keep things moving. Okay. I'll take with that. Okay, nobody touch the giant sticky. <laughs> <laughs> so if I'm remembering correctly, um, there were a lot of check marks on the copyright question as well as the prioritization um, question there as well. So let's go ahead and look at the copyright question because I know that's a big one. Um, and again, feel free to unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, copyright. What the, the place that I'm coming from it, from our own collection interest right now, is the fact that we are looking at published journals, scholarly journals. So I would love to digitize them for our internal use in the off chance that the mold comes back, right? So how do you approach um, digitizing content that is you can't make readily available, right? So you, we wouldn't be able to just put that out there so that everybody could see, you know, an issue of, of science, uh, you know, because science is already there making that content available. So is that even something that we could pursue? But I would love for you all to jump in if you've got any, um, if you'd like to expand on your interest in copyright to just go ahead and unmute or to throw that into the chat or if you have any ideas on where we're coming from with our scholarly journals, always open to those insights. Hi, this is Angie from Houston Public Library. Um, so in regards to copyright, I've had a few instances with that, um, not necessarily with uh, scholarly journals, but with, um, uh, items published for like um, centennials and such that are like groups were published and by the time you want to digitize them, you know, they were probably in their 70s when the, the community was in their 70s when they were published. Um, so there is a part of copyright law that allows for educational purposes that you can digitize. And I feel like, like definitely these scholarly items would be would fall underneath that. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with rightsstatement.org, but that is something that we use if you uh, are part of the so with TDL and going into DPLA, they require you to use rightstatement.org. Um, and that gives you the different rights statements that you can use for copyright. And there isn't, like I said, there's an education one. Um, and that's what I would recommend um, for your scholarly items. Um, even if you do just, uh, keep them in house. Um, that's kind of the great thing about digitizing. You can digitize yeah. in house and then make that available to uh, one of your patrons or whoever needs to do that research on a one on one basis. Um, but that also goes into the file storage issue, which I'm also happy to talk on if we get there. But um, so definitely take a look at at rightstatement.org. Um, there are some, you know, we Copyright's scary, but there are some loopholes. <laughs> Angie, you are a VIP right now. Thank you so much. You're you're very welcome. I've uh, I've had a few things with this, a few issues. <laughs> so I get you. I feel you. <laughs> Perfect. And I appreciate people throwing in some additional content there, some resources for copyright too. So any other questions on copyright that any of you wanted to expand on? at this point in time. Yeah. And again, this Jamboard will be available. So if you do have resources you want to share or comments you would like to make, um, you can always come back and, and throw those in here as well. More than welcome to. And thank you, Christy, for putting the link into the chat as well. Marion, thanks for your comment. In my experience digitizing theses and dissertations, something that I've run into is items with borrower's notice, which is slightly different than a copyright. Perfect, okay. And we will be getting to that file storage um, preservation versus working 
slide later in um, the Jamboard too. So get ready for that one. I'm going to move us to the next question. Oh, Edward, thank you. That is going to be a very useful link. So Edward threw into the chat here. I'll copy that and put it into the Jamboard as well. that libraries can make, oh, thank you, Edward, perfect. Not needed, he already added it. But libraries can make copies for preservation. Great, thank you so much. So here's our storage question. So what are the options that you've heard of or come across for storage, discovery, or access, you know, the infrastructure that needs to be in place, either in-house or third party, to support your digitized collections? And Leah, thank you so much for your help on <laughs> that exploding blue sticky from the previous Jamboard slide. I appreciate that. We tried to break it. <laughs> no, I had a call this morning with um, Jeff Sharp with Internet Archive, um, just kind of exploratory. So that was one of the things that we came across as an option. Um, but I'm hoping that there's, you know, if there's anything else that you have used or any other systems, even if it's not for just the controlled in-house, you know, of our scholarly collections, I would just love to learn what other services are out there um, that we can capture and share with the rest of the community as well. Got it. Our library is lucky enough to be part of our organization's informational technology department. So we do have a great relationship with our IT staff. Um, so if exploring something in-house um, is an option, we can certainly move in that direction. Great. I have not heard of Archivematica. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Hi, it's Angie again. It's very similar to Preservica, um, but the, it has very different uh, ways you can use it. Um, and I wanted to speak about like to the server space. Um, the way Houston Public Library does it, uh, the digital archive is actually also under IT. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, our, it's very different than a lot of institutions where you, they're very they're different departments right. um and i'm saying like i put in uh even a separate server so what they did for us is uh we have multiple servers obviously we're a very large uh, public library system um but the digital archive has their own server um where we can uh preserve our items in the optimal file format that we need to so we don't have to compress them just to keep them um, and then we also recently started using preservica and for us preservica is a dark archive um, so we don't have a public end of preservica so what we do is anything that i have on our server any of our preservation copies go into preservica on our server we keep you know access copies preservation anything working it's really our working area um, and then Preservica is, this collection is done, or as done as it's going to be, and it goes into Preservica. Um, so that's really something to keep in mind. And then keep in mind setting, when you're setting up your server space, setting up folders um, like an archive. Um, that's a really big thing that, it's you know the uh, server space servers aren't always set up like an archive they're set up like maybe you'll set up your computer but setting it up like an archive you have maybe your book title 18 11 um geo survey or whatever it is and then you have your preservation copies and your access copies within that one title and um, we have them set up by collection um, but our top level is like av archive manuscripts etc um, so that's something if you don't set it up 
and like really think of your setup, then a few years down the road, you're going to look at it and it's going to be a mess and you're going to be like, what are, what did you do? Yeah. Um, so I've, I've actually dealt with that as a digital archivist at three separate institutions. So it's definitely something to consider and talk with people about. That is fantastic advice. And in terms of setting something up like an archive, um, are there guidelines for that? Is there kind of a framework for, for doing that kind of um, out there? I haven't used any, and I'm not, maybe someone else can speak to that. Um, for me, it was very much like um, trying to set it up like the physical archive was set up. So I would use, I used like their cut, like the folders are their collection names. And then the, their, the file names are, um, or the item names are the, like each item number from the collection. So that if someone requested an item from the finding aid, mm -hmm. then they can find it within our server. Cause all they would have to do is be like, oh, this is a done collection. This collection's been digitized. Oh, this is the this is our uploaded folder. I'm going to go to the collection number, and then they can go to the access or preservation folder if they want the JPEG. Say it's a photograph. Go to the pre access folder and find that number. Okay. So we set it up very similar to um, how our boxes and folders are set up with the physical archive. Um, but I would, I would love to hear what everybody else is doing in, in regards to that, but that's kind of how I've done it uh, throughout. And even with books, it was, you know, it's the book and then it's like page one, page two, right? So for your, for your items, and then we had an access copy for books. We use uh, just a PDF or a PDF A for okay. our books. Thank you. You're very welcome. Anyone else wanted to chime in on anything that you've put here or in or expand on what Angie had mentioned as well? All right. So we're going to move on to the next question. One of my favorite questions. <laughs> So other than uh, presenting a reverse uh, workshop at TCDL, what collaborations, partnerships, grants, and support groups exist um, to support collection digitization pursuits? I know Leah had put into the chat um, a working group, I believe, or an interest group um, that we will certainly be making ourselves a part of. Thank you so much. Great. Oh, that's a good one. Hadn't thought about that. Thank you. State Historical Societies. What does CLIR stand for? <clears throat> oh, sorry, that was me. Uh, clear. You know what? I just realized I don't know what the acronym stands for, but they're <laughs> part of TLF. Let me Google that and I will get back to you. Thank you so much. And I will add one. I know Leah had mentioned prior to this, Talker, is it Talker Foundation? Yes, the Talker Family Foundation funds a lot of digitization projects and other library projects in Texas. Archivist Think Tank on Facebook, great, okay. going to increase that one as well. Digital Preservation Interest Group, charmingly abbreviated as DPIG. You gotta love it. Great. Now, those of you who have mentioned some of these, have you um, participated in them? You know, the ones that you have mentioned, um, what kind of, are they um, 
organizations that provide grants or are they organizations where you know, discussions can happen to help you pursue your own digitization projects? What are we looking at here? When it comes to the historical society, um, I'm actually working out of Kansas, um, but we have a collection that is a specific town. And so that town historical society did all the scanning. Mm. Um, and so they took care of that front loading work. And then we added all of the metadata and um, at the storage site. Um, then we also had a county historical society that did a different collection and so it was really interesting that just casting out there and saying, hey, you know, if you if you are interested in, you know, helping us with this material that happens to be in your area, like if your journals are for a specific thing, anybody who might have an interest in that um, might be willing to do some help with the legwork. That's great information. Thank you, Crystal. Was it Crystal speaking? Indeed, yeah. Okay. I should have been like, hi, I'm Crystal. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Perfect, appreciate it. And I don't know what TSLAC Text Treasures is. Anyone willing to expand on that one? Uh, the Texas State Library and Archives. Uh, they have a grant program that uh, you can apply for, and uh, people often do digitization projects through it. Awesome. Thank you, Marcia. Any of you have any questions on these or want to expand on any of the information here? Several, you, several of you have mentioned TDL's imaging group. Um, tell me more. We're going to join it. <laughs> but while we're here, um, information you'd like to share about the group? Jarrell, I see your notes in the chat here. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Erin, did you want to give an overview or would you like for me to do that? Of, I'm sorry, of the imaging group? Yeah. Go, go right ahead, Jarrell. Okay. <laughs> so um, everyone on a, uh, was it 2019, Aaron, TCDL? Correct. Yeah, we had talked about launching a group um, just to talk about imaging issues and give support for digital imaging folks in the state of Texas. Um, and so, Shannon Willis, Derek Rankins, um, and Marcia McIntosh started that group. And so since then, we've had a number of um, meeting sessions. We had an in-person meeting in Houston right before the pandemic started. I think that was my last event before the pandemic started. So we were able to meet before that, which was great, great timing. Um, <clears throat> and so what we focus on is just giving support to our colleagues and uh, letting everyone know that there are solutions to some of the problems that come up in, in digitization. And many of us have the same issues and you know whether that's communicating with vendors and getting what you need or uh, learning how to photograph um, a shiny thing. You know, uh, most folks in digitization know that, uh, you know, digitizing something with a reflection can offer some unique challenges. And so those are some of the things that we talk about among other things. And if I miss something, other folks on the call that, that are in the group should definitely jump in. Thanks so much. I don't, I don't know if Erin wanted to mention, um, I believe y'all just uh, created or have put out there a resource for basic guide to still digitization. Yes, I just dropped yeah. that into the chat. Thanks for uh, the reminder. It's, it's very new and uh, we're excited to have other people take a look at and contribute. Perfect, thank you so much. And Marcia, I apologize for mispronouncing your name earlier. I'm very aware of mispronouncing names. So uh, thank you, Jarrell, for pronouncing it correctly so I can make that correction. You're fine, I am what I like. <laughs> 
you, you had to flow. Yeah. You're good. I get it all the time. <laughs> Great. Well, I appreciate all of this information here. So we covered this one earlier. I had I put it in just in case the copyright question for whatever reason did not pop up in the um, what questions we should be asking before we even start pursuing a digitization project. But again, we were looking at the digitization of scholarly journals and was that even possible and considerations for controlled access and copyright. Um, and Angie uh, provided a lot of great information about some possibilities there. So again, appreciate that. Um, I know we've got about 10 minutes left and Leah had mentioned, um, I have a thank you slide, but just in case, um, I'm going to create a new slide kind of in between that here. If any of you would like to leave contact information, I promise I won't spam you, but I think just as a record um, or information for any of these, let me add that. That would be useful. But I'd like to open it up now. If there was a question that we didn't get to or information that you would still like to talk about, we still have a good nine minutes or so to just kind of um, have an informal discussion about anything. But before that, thank you so much. I really do appreciate your being here today and you're sharing so much information. Um, like Elaine had mentioned in the keynote, we can learn a lot from each other. Um, and so I appreciate you just being so willing to share all of that information. This is Crystal again. Um, there was one item that I wanted to touch on, and that is um, your prioritization of content. Mm -hmm. um, do you, uh, you had collected so many good statistics and information to prove um, that why this material is necessary. Are you able to use that, that same content to under, determine which ones were used the most and prioritize those as the items to start the collection with? That is a, a, a great question. I don't have the data in front of me, but I'm pretty sure that we could, especially with the interlibrary loan data, take a look at what was the most requested content, what has most been used. We had been focusing more or less on what was the most obscure or the, the rarest content or the oldest content or the most delicate content in the collection. Um, so we'll certainly take a look at that. And I'm, I'd be curious if the most, like if we're using, if what we're using heavily is also content that is readily available electronically as well, because that may save us some, some time and effort on that end. But that is a, a great point. Thank you for that. Any final thoughts? Christy, thank you for reposting that Jamboard link. I appreciate your contact information. I look forward to seeing all of you in the TDL imaging group. <laughs> we'll be sure to come there with a little bit more of a framework and uh, solid ideas to move forward with, but I do appreciate your time and effort just helping us get off the ground with information. Thank you so much. Michelle, thanks for um, being one of the first ever reverse workshops. Uh, thank you it. all for making this a successful reverse workshop. So <laughs> all I had to do was ask you to participate and it would not have been anything if nobody had put all these ideas and great information on the Jamboard or unmuted and discussed. I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, you know where to find us if any other questions come up will do. All right. Well, I guess we can give you back six minutes of your day here, of your afternoon. Um, I do appreciate the information. 
Again, the Jamboard link has been reposted in the chat. This will be available. And I'll also update the session information as well with the Jamboard link, just so that's available to the entire community. In case those people who haven't been able to attend today or would be interested would have this available to them to add some additional information. So thank you again, really appreciate your time and your information today. Thank you so much, Michelia. This was super fun. I think it's been my favorite session of the day <laughs> by far. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.